Hi, my name is Julie Roca, and you have joined us at my podcast, Aging Gracefully with Julie Roca. As we age, everyone wants to know, how do we stay in charge of life? It can feel like life is stepping in and like we lose control. But sometimes people come into our the senior years and they're well prepared. And to see how they enjoy life and life goes a lot more according to their plan, if they have a plan, makes me realize that um, – our next guest really was onto something when she wrote her book. Uh, so I had Star Bradbury, the author of Successfully Navigating Your Parents' Senior Years, come and join us today. Thank so welcome, you, Star. Thank you, Julie. It really is a pleasure to be here. And you, you really touched on um, why I wrote the book, why I wrote the book to begin with. Uh, and the focus of the book is really to help people develop a plan. Uh, I spent 25 years in senior living. Yes. Um, as an administrative director of both an assisted living facility, then a memory care facility, and then 18 years at a life care community. And during that time, I really did help. I, I figured it out, so this is not an exaggeration, but thousands of families. I believe um, that, yes. Well, you know, 24 years is a long time. Yes. And yeah. during that time, I met with so many families, and it became clear to me that um, people kind of assume um, that they're going to age successfully, mm -hmm. or I love your term, aging gracefully. Uh, yes. But they don't really have a plan. Right. You know, and I used to joke with people, did you plan for retirement? Most people do plan yes, yeah. for years. Yes, for retirement, but somehow they think that that planning should stop, and they don't focus on what I'd like to say is might be the last 20 or even 30 years of your life. Yeah, exactly. And you can't just assume it's going to all fall into place, Julie. Exactly, and I love in your book, and, I, and I've now quoted this numerous <laughs> times, um, that we have the go-go times in life. And then we hit a slow go time. Right. And then for almost everyone, there will be a no go time. There will be a no go time. Unless, um, I mean, we all know people, sadly, who may pass away, but did mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. almost um, right up until the end that you'll hear people say, you know, my dad was playing golf five times a week and my mom was, you know, living life full and then suddenly they passed away. And many of us say, Boy, if I could check that box, yes, that would be wonderful. that would be that would be wonderful. But uh, yeah. we don't get that option because, like you mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. we're all planning for something. Right. But most of us are planning for the go-go time. Right. For I'm the, planning right. for the travel. I'm right. planning to, you know, knock things off my bucket list that and I and that's didn't all get good. To do and you definitely yeah. should do that. Yes, exactly. But there's more to plan than just that go-go time. So I know that you refer to um, some pillars. Some yes, pillars of, of successful aging. I do. And it was hard to narrow it that? down. Yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, in my book, I talk about the five pillars of aging successfully. And um, I didn't invent these. You'll probably go, oh, yeah, that's true. I've, I've, I've got that one covered. But in my experience in sitting down with uh, families and talking with them, usually there's one or two of these pillars that they haven't really thought through. Mm -hmm. Pillar number one that I think is the most important to start with is where do you want to age? And by that I mean where do you want to actually location-wise mm -hmm. uh, live the last part of your life, which again now the fastest-growing demographic in the United States today are the ages between 90 and 100. Right. Yes. And so many people just don't even think about, am I going to really live that long? And where might I be living if I'm 80, 85, 90, 95? 100. Or 100. And we I have a lot I know. Of I, I have clients, consulting clients, mm -hmm. whose um, moms and usually some dads, are in their advanced ages, many still living alone, some requiring more help than others. So you, the thing is, we just don't know. So my goal is to get people to plan. Pillar number one, 
Where do you want to age? And so we already know from the statistics and the research that 90% of all seniors want to age in place. You and I know yes. aging in place means I want to stay in my home. I do not want to move. I never want to move to um, a community or live in a facility. And many, many people start out with that. That yes. may or may not wind up to be true. Mm -hmm. But I always say, great, let's sit down and look at how strong your plan is if you say, I'm checking the box for staying in my home and aging in place. Again, people just say that. Yes. And I like to say, uh, that is a statement. <laughs> that yes. is not a plan. It's and not. the first question I ask is, how strong is your support team? Yep. What, who is on your support team? If you tell me, one, I have no children, I'm estranged from my children, my children live in other states, in other countries, then we better look at where is your support team going to come from? Mm -hmm. Do you have people who you know you could call who would take you to the hospital, feed your pets if you were in the hospital, mm -hmm. help you with some of the activities of daily living, mm -hmm. shopping, talking to your doctor, getting you to medical appointments? Yeah. How strong is your support team? And that's one of the first questions I ask. And if you're thinking about moving, I'm thinking about moving closer to my daughter who lives in another state, another city. Or I might move closer to my family where I grew up. I've moved away, but I still have lots of family back in Ohio or Michigan. Or friends or, even. Or friends, People right. People move for their friends. Yes. Yeah. Well, plan years ahead of that need. Go to that city or that community and look at what are the living costs there? What is access to health care? We yes. all know that's getting harder and harder. Yes. Don't move out to a rural community that's an hour or two from medical help or care, much less a hospital. So there's just – it's a very practical approach when mm -hmm. you think about it. So yeah. that's pillar number one. Yeah. Should I go on? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, this is probably going to be a little more familiar to most of you because pillar number two are do you have – the correct medical documents in place to age gracefully or successfully. Yes. And you know. I get on a soapbox with yes, this one. Yes. Well, tell me what you think they are and let's see if we're in so, agreement. So you need to have a power of attorney because yes. honestly, we may be in that go-go time of life. Right. And all it takes is having yeah. a stroke. Right. Where you suddenly can't speak for yourself or getting into a car accident. Right, so even, at any age. Even my 18-year-old could get into a car right. accident, and who is then allowed to speak for them because they're of legal age? Yes. Um, I have heard nightmarish things oh. about people that do not have that in place, and then the physicians are basically making the decisions and taking over that part for someone they don't know at all. Well, when you introduced me, one of the things that you said that probably everybody's ears perked up, is how can you stay more in control of your life as you age? Because if you talked to seniors and said, what is really, really important to you, here's what I've heard over and over again. I want to stay as independent as possible for as long as possible, and I want to be the one making decisions. I actually had somebody the other day actually at church say, why did you write your book for for, you know, navigating your parents' senior years. Why didn't you write it for, <laughs> for us? Well, here's the good news. It you is. can You can read the book, too, and extrapolate. But I decided that in my years of experience that it was the adult kids, now don't be upset with me if you're out there listening, that were pretty much clueless about what to do when they were thrown in the middle of a crisis with their parents. Yes. And I listen, I am so sympathetic. That happened to me as well, meaning oh, my gosh, you know, my, my, my mother needs to go to skilled nursing. My father was just rushed to the hospital. We're all busy leading our lives, working, mm -hmm. raising families, and then, bam, you're thrown into a crisis. So uh, it's not as if both multi-generations can benefit from my book, but I really felt, I had somebody plead with me, Star, please write a book for, for my generation we don't know what our options are. And so that's really the focus is helping educate you ahead of the crisis on what your options are. Yeah. 
and starting those conversations. I just can't early. stress that enough. Early. People say early? Well, how early? Honestly, I, if it were me and I had it to do it all over again, my parents are long gone. I would have sat down with them when they were in their early 60s, Julie, Yeah, that's what I said, too. And said, let's start these conversations long before the need because there's no pressure. Exactly. There's no crisis. I think you'll find your parents more willing to, to talk about this. Of course, yes. we got a little off topic. Let's get back to the, you said, power of attorney. Power of attorney is mm-hmm. one of those. And mm-hmm. then I also think you need to have, you need to have your, your will set up. Your, Yes, you not just your living know. will. Right. And really, you're talking about pillar number three. And, and they're really, I almost combined them two because pillar number two is medical. And, yeah. un, and so let's not forget the importance of a living will and appointing a health care surrogate. A health care yes. surrogate. And just in eyes. case anybody is listening that might say, what's that? Health care surrogate, health care proxy, health care surrogate. This is the person who can, you're trusting Mm-hmm. to make critical medical decisions for you at the end of your life when you may not be able to speak for yourself. Or even in that crisis moment, sometimes yes. people will have had a, a crisis, like a heart attack or a stroke, mm-hmm. in right. which they can't speak for themselves right. for maybe days, maybe right. weeks at Correct. a time. And so you need to make sure that you trust the person that totally. you are you are assigning this um, to, to to know what it is that you want and having these conversations ahead of time so that they do know mm-hmm. setting aside a living will that says this is what I want in the case of needing um, equipment to extend my life when I may exactly. not be mentally capable of making any decisions for myself ever again. I, I don't want to be left like that. Right. Do you really so, want to be on a, yeah. a res- resuscitated? Do you really want right. to be yeah. uh, um, kept alive beyond a reasonable time where you're no longer functioning or you might not even have any brain function? Mm, right. I think it's, that's yeah. people's biggest fears. And yet... And yet there's a very high percentage of people as well, you know, who have just keep putting that off. So I can't stress enough. Do not put it off. I think you might find the opposite may happen. That Once you've actually completed a living will and, of course, choosing a healthcare surrogate means you have had a very intense conversation with that person. For example, I asked one of my sons and he said, absolutely not. Mom, no, there is no way that Mm -hmm. I could ever pull, as he said, pull the plug on you. I said, thank you for your honesty, right? Yes. You know, yeah. rather know now, okay. And then all my kids live in other states. I mean, like East Coast, West Coast, right. Chicago, there's, they're not close. And so often you want to choose someone who's actually physically close and could be get there. to the hospital, be physically with you, um, and also that knows your wishes. Mm-hmm. Remember, they are carrying out your wishes, and having been a healthcare surrogate and having to make some personal tough decisions, um, I always had to remind myself: it is not my wishes. Yes, that person asked me to be their healthcare surrogate because they trusted me to carry out their, their wishes. wishes. Yeah, and so they... it's a big deal, rightfully so, and um, you want to make sure that you've had that conversation. Yep. That person's likely to be around. In other words, if they're 90 now, that's probably not a a good ask. Yes. You know, you want to have somebody that's available, willing, that you trust. So that falls under all the medical, you know, the living will, the health care surrogate. And then pillar number three is legal, legal and financial documents. Those are the power of attorney, your will will. Now, remember, a living will has to do with end of life decisions and an actual will has to do with assets. After life. <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> when I die, life. this is, I want Susie to get this piece of jewelry and I want the house to be sold and those assets to be divided as I state in my will. I want, mm-hmm. th- it's your sort of what happens with everything that you have left in, in the world and, and how would you like that gifted or given? It could be. Um, a, of course, a charitable gift. Yes. So you yeah. never know. But if and people sometimes people say to me, but I just don't have that much. Uh, yes. And I hear that. regularly. I hear that, too. And I and go, hmm, even, well, let's let's talk. Even the little things I have seen 
people lose so much because um, the parent did not put things in a will properly, and then it went into probate for a mm-hmm. long time, mm-hmm. and maybe the loved one mm-hmm. that they probably wanted to have didn't, that I've thing, seen that too. They either didn't get it, or they got such a small portion of it. Really, it had been ripped apart. Or and, a free for all. Yeah, a free for all by and, family and, members who may or may not and it, have been uh, your your choice. And it can cause. That always makes me sad real strife sometimes oh, between terrible. family members that can just really disrupt. So I, I always say it's a it's a good selfless thing to do to sit down with an attorney and get those documents. It's done a kindness. Right. Yeah. It's it a, is. and you if you already know that your family is contentious mm-hmm. or <laughs> you know that only gonna make sisters worse. don't get along or um don't don't leave that confusion behind. Again I have seen the peace of mind that it can bring a family. Yeah. If everybody knows these decisions have been made, mom put it in writing, dad put it in writing, and um, it, it, I've seen families torn apart, sadly. Yeah, so that's pillars two and three, medical, financial, um, p- powers of attorney. Again, someone who can make mm-hmm. decisions for you when you're still around but yeah. unable to speak. Yeah. And a, di- a little different as now, just for some clarity, your power of attorney could also be your healthcare surrogate. They yes, don't have they to be separate be. people. And often they are the same person, but they don't have to be. A healthcare surrogate is strictly medical, but a power of attorney can um, make decisions for you about um, financial and, and yes, mm-hmm. all of that legal. And then um, pillar number four, you want me to go on? Yes, please. <laughs> just please checking do. in. Um, is how will I pay for long-term care? And, and this, I get boy, this that is daily. <laughs> so, oh, I bet you do. Yeah. I mean, in your other role, that's what you focus on all the time. Yes. Yeah. And it's such a rude awakening for people yeah. when they go, "What? Medicare doesn't pay for assisted living?" Or mm. I thought Medicare paid for skilled nursing. There's yeah. such a huge. Source of confusion out there about who pays what, which I have a whole chapter in the book, you know, about, about paying for pay. long-term care mm-hmm. and what you can expect. Yeah. And, and especially, I mean, let's face it. Did you know anything about, well, that, that's not a fair question. <laughs> I'll speak for myself. I knew nothing about who paid for long-term care when I was in my 40s or 50s. It wasn't on my radar. It only yeah. became on my radar when my parents went into crisis and mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out, well, who's paying for home care? They need, they can't come home from the hospital without some help. I thought Medicare paid for home care. Oh, yeah. Care. I mean, that's probably what you get the most confusion on. I get um, very educated people um, and some people even that are in the health care realm that say, oh, my goodness, you know, now's the time I think we need to look at some assisted living for mom or bringing home health into the home. Uh, and they say, and she has Medicare. And, and then I, always... I can tell that the plan was Medicare is going to take care of it. And they are always shocked to hear Medicare is not, not. going to take care of it. No. Or I hear oh, we have VA benefits. Well, you may be able to eke out some home health care, you may be able to get some assisted living care, but it is not a guarantee and there are processes. And there's lists and it takes time. And it takes time. So you really need to have things put in place so that you can. Long before the need. Long before the need. I tell tell some of my clients, especially um, solo seniors, people who either live far from their Mm -hmm. kids or support team, live alone, You don't have to wait until a crisis to interview a home care agency. And you could even say, right now I don't need any care, but if I fell and I I, or something happened and I did, I'd like to get to know you a little bit. Mm -hmm. They would come and Mm -hmm. talk to you and do an assessment. You'd at least be on their radars so that when you're calling saying, I just found out I have to have surgery or I had a fall and I'm going to be discharged and that way, again, staying more in control of your life mm-hmm. and who's going to provide that care, you make some of these decisions by being proactive. Yes. Whether it is I see my mom and dad, my beloved aunt, my whoever, whatever loved one that you are trying to be supportive of, yep. 
or for yourself as a senior, that you take some of these steps to develop a plan Mm -hmm. and be more um, uh, intentional and conscious about how you would like things to unfold as you age and age successfully. That's what I try to do is help people build a plan to age successfully. Yes, and I have seen seen this work now that I have been um, in the placement business for uh, now almost a couple of years. Um, where I've had clients that have said, hey, we're doing very well in our home right now, but Mm -hmm. we did decide to move closer to family a few years ago to make this a little easier. We are seeing that we're having some more um, physical issues happening. And so we wanted to get a plan in place. And we did. We sat down as a family together and discussed what it was that they wanted, what they could afford, where they thought that they might want to go, they set up tours so that they could exactly. see those Ooh, you get an A+. Plus. And they recently uh-huh. um, had a an incident that meant that they weren't doing as well in the home. But we knew. We knew exactly what, to what do. the next steps were supposed to be. So they were ready. Mm-hmm. They got what they mm-hmm. wanted. Mm -hmm. And it was so much smoother than the calls that I get from frantic children of their parents saying, oh, my goodness, I'm in I'm in North Carolina. My family is in Florida. Dad has fallen. Um, I can't get there. Mom has Mm. dementia. I can't get there. I don't know what to do. Those are the calls that I really hope that your book helps. us. This is a this is a primer. My book is a. Mm-hmm. A step-by-step guide and primer it is, yes. because it really does cover the basics. Uh, I, I talk to so many people who do not know that there's really a difference between a home health care or home, home health care company or agency and home health. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay? And so yeah. they're wasting their time and money calling companies who are happy to take the job but but maybe you're fine with a home care mm-hmm. companion that's half the cost or maybe even a third of the cost of hiring a home care nurse. You don't need a physical therapist. You don't need an occupational therapist. Right. Now, some of those costs will be covered by Medicare after you're yeah. discharged from the hospital, and there's always contingencies. But mm-hmm. often for somebody to stay in their home and get the help that they need, it yeah. might be a home care companion. Yes. But, Julie, I, I just see that... Um, I promise, I promise you when I'm speaking to the adult children now who say, oh, my God, I just can't add anything to my plate. Yeah, yeah. Taking the time to develop a plan yes. now yeah. ahead of a crisis, sitting down with your parents and starting out with very, very gentle questions. I really ha- almost have a, a, a chapter on coaching you how to bring this you conversation do, up. That. Because I've just seen how hard it is. So what would, what kind of question would you start with, let's say, if you think, gosh, I just haven't talked to my parents about, don't jump in and say, have you done your will? Right. Let's no. get that living will done. Don't start no. with that, no. especially if you know it's a sensitive topic already. Yeah. You, I would suggest that you sit down and start with questions like, um, have you thought about where you want to live when you retire, mom and daddy? Thinking about staying in Gainesville, or have you considered maybe moving closer to me in Minneapolis? I mean, Uh, just making that up, of course, but very soft, gentle questions. Have you thought about your retirement? Right. I I mean, other than wanting to travel the world. Right. Tell me about... The the slogan. What? Yeah, right. (laughs) Tell me about what your retirement looks like outside of travel. Yeah, Uh, those kinds of thoughts. And then getting in your book, you get very practical. Um, For example, one of the things that a lot of people need to do is they need to look at their bathroom. Can you even access your bathroom and your bedroom? If your your bedroom and your bathroom is on the second floor, right? And all of a sudden you have problems with your knees or problems with your back. I've seen or hips. people or hips Hip surgery. and you can't get to the top of the stairs. You can't really crawl up the stairs. No. Most people don't want to be crawling up the stairs right. or bumping on their butt all yeah. the way down yeah. to the bottom. Right. So how are you going to navigate that? And I love that you addressed even those kinds of things that people just don't always think about. No. But and it's I, part I of know. making that plan. I, I had a client who 
uh, lived in a like a three story house. All bedrooms and bathrooms are upstairs, and she just didn't want to really think about it, and mm-hmm. her kids didn't want to say. So they brought me in to sit and say, <laughs> "Yeah, I'm a little concerned um, with you being in a wheelchair, uh, un- sadly indefinitely." How are you right. going to negotiate? Because she said, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. Well, you know, as hard as it may be to accept, um, I I really feel that the seniors that open their perspective and open their minds a little bit to realize that staying in your home, aging in place, may or may not allow you to remain as independent as possible Yes. For the longest possible time. It may not give you the freedom that you think you have. Correct. I recently Correct. went to the home of a client, and um, she was there with a companion, with a home care companion. And I realized in the visit that she struggled to get out of her chair and up the one step to the downstairs bathroom. And in looking around, I had noticed that there was a bed in the mm-hmm. dining room, and she had a second story. And I said, what's upstairs? upstairs. All her bedrooms. Right. Her bedrooms right. and the second bath, which she had not been upstairs in two and a half okay. or three oh, years. Gosh, star. Julie. So who knew what <laughs> was upstairs? So we were then talking about, you know, downsizing. She's like, I, I don't even know what I have upstairs anymore because wow. she had not been up there in years. But that's entirely believable, and I've certainly seen it, it happen. Is. And so, for example— you see that your parents are saying, we're going to age in place. Mm -hmm. And clearly their home is not suitable for aging well in place. You might say, um, let's talk about what your plan would be if you weren't able to go up and down the stairs or your bathrooms are all upstairs. Because believe me, you and I know that moving, when it's already a crisis or your mobility Mm -hmm. is impaired, is hard. It's hard. Moving is yes. uh, like when when you look up the ten most stressful things in life, and that's of course losing a spouse or your partner. Um, but underneath that, in the top five, moving, yes, changing yeah. jobs, moving is stressful. Mm-hmm. And when people procrastinate on this, I like to remind them it doesn't get easier as you get yeah. older. If you know that moving would be advantageous downsizing one story or moving closer to your kids and finding a home that's yes I, as i say just because you move closer to your support team well whoever they may be doesn't mean you have to live with them right. you know i will right. i exactly. will tell you a funny story i the title of this book which is by the way okay here's my my chance to <laughs> yes successfully navigating your parents senior years i actually for a while, talked with my publisher and agent about uh, calling it, your parents don't want to live with you either. <laughs> I, and I love that name. That might be easier for me to remember because your title is very long, but it's oh, very Oh, we went through so much about this title. I just can't tell <laughs> your parents, you. Don't, your yeah. parents. And actually, I thought that there was some humor, which I liked, and some truth, which I liked. Yeah. But um, not everybody liked that title. Right, right. So I that, 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 that did be. not win out, okay? But the truth is, in my 25 years in senior living, I never, I won't say never, I rarely interviewed seniors themselves or helped a family where they said, oh, yeah, we want to live with our kids. We can't wait to move in with our kids. That you and I both know that yeah. is just not true. Well, even my parents said that. You may for love years. your kids. My parents for years said, "Oh, well, we can't wait to move in with our kids," but then I noticed that they were given the option to live right in the backyard of my brother in their own home. And man, guess where they are six months out of the year? Happily, they're right there. So near in their own home, in their own but home, near. Yeah. which actually brings up one of the other chapters, which is. Uh, Creative alternatives to think about. Um, I, saw I that. love the tiny home option. I do too. You I've know, got, if you want, yeah. if you say, "Hey, mom, would you think about moving closer to me?" And by the way, we have enough room and land. Would you think about paying for, helping to pay for a tiny home option where you've got your own space, your own place, but you're nearby? 
So I, I, I recognize that not everybody can afford assisted living or a life care yep. community. There's an entire chapter on life care communities. Are they worth the high cost? Mm-hmm. Um, looking at what options will work for you and your family. And Julie, yes. there is no one right answer, there except isn't. that it, I, I always say it's not if your parents are going to need help, it's when. Because unless it's when. you are that person that, you know, just falls asleep one day and just doesn't wake up, you will have some sort of even if it's temporary need or need for your children or need for help, right. even if it's temporary. Right. People so. don't think about the temporary part, you know, because if you have um, hip replacement surgery, mm-hmm. you're going to really need help for uh, at least a week or two. Mm-hmm. Um, any, any kind of surgery where if you know you live alone, uh, you're inviting a friend or a family or somebody to come and be with you. But there's no reason not to have a plan in place, whether it's yeah. planned surgery or unplanned fall or an event, like you said, and recognizing that um, procrastinating or avoiding all of this yes. uh, is not a proactive approach where, that lets you make the decisions. And, and stay I've, in control. I've noticed in my work with Alzheimer's and dementia that sometimes when mm-hmm. you're starting to notice um, memory changes, if you procrastinate and you put Ooh. it off, you may get yourself to a point where your loved one can no longer think rationally like you and I are. And then everything that has to happen is, is tenfold harder. At that point, you may be then required to go get guardianship. Which is a disaster. Which is a year and thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, so getting taking the time to sit down when your parents and your loved ones are still rational mm-hmm. and they're still able to make these decisions for themselves, knowing that when we don't have control and something like dementia does start to to make changes in the brain, you might not be dealing with someone who's going to be able to make these changes down the road, and they may kick and scream when you do. Right. So lay right. it out. Have mm-hmm. it in writing, mm-hmm. and that makes it a lot easier. Just last um, Sunday, uh, actually at church, uh, someone I don't know came up, and she found out that I'd written this book, and she said, oh, well, maybe you can help me. I'm so upset. I'm just so angry, and she clearly was. Mm-hmm. My children are trying to tell me, you know, what to do, and they think I have Alzheimer's, and I don't mm-hmm. think I do. I, I am forgetful. I am writing Post-it notes all over the house, mm-hmm. but there's nothing the matter with me. I'm fine, and they're trying to tell me what to do. That is not the time as a not. child that you are going to want to try to sit down with someone who's already fearful, angry, um, and it's not as if you couldn't have noticed that right. something is going on. And I will tell you if, and there's a chapter on long-distance caregiving, because what happens is um, if you don't live close to your parents and you are only seeing them once a year, pick up on right, these things. and yeah. you're just talking to them on the phone, believe me, people become adept at masking mm-hmm. their memory loss. And unless you are there for two, three, four days and really looking for some of the red flags that, we know about that yes. I list yep. for possible dementia or something going on. Mm-hmm. You don't want to wait till then. You want to have these conversations long before that because if you went to any elder law attorney, they would say this, whatever you do, do not embark on a guardianship unless you have time, money, yes. patience. They will try to advise on every possible option besides guardianship. And yet, a good attorney, any attorney, is not going to allow somebody who clearly has cognitive issues, serious cognitive issues, to sign legal yes. documents. And make life all And then yep. you've lost any chance of managing what's already a difficult situation it in a way that so really is to, is to your parents' advantage. Mm-hmm. And I warn uh, the adult children, you're not... You're not making a plan for your parents. You are working with them, developing a plan. You are listening when you're asking some of these questions. I, what and I are love your that. 
what are your plans for retirement, mom and dad? And that gives and, them the ability to very clearly say, and maybe this figure is it out for themselves. They might not even yeah, know yet. Yeah, they might. They may not have thought about it because, again, we all think about what we're going to do in the go go. Yes. The slow go and the no go years. It's hard, hard, a much lot harder of people to think don't about. Don't want to sit and think about that. So, but it's important. But you know what I learned? I learned. I used to think that um, as your parents got older, they would be more willing <laughs> to have these conversations. They're less willing but, the older they But get. my actual experience of, of 25 years with families is that the closer it becomes a possible reality, moving into yes. the slow go, no go, of course this makes sense. The more fear comes up, the less willing people are. That is why I say, Oh, you want to open up these conversations. And 60 what, or 65 is yes. what I tell people. Start I even, having them. Yes. I even have an imaginary uh, family that uh, we weave, I weave through and the I book. I love that. Yeah. Um, so that some of the principles that I discuss that will help you be a guide as you make decisions through the, these, from the go go, slow go, no go years. Um, you can actually see how this family takes these and applies them to real yeah. practical situations so that it's not it's not an academic book in the sense mm-hmm. that you read it and you go, I didn't I don't really know what to do now. It's it's not applicable information. I wrote it so it would be. Yeah. Hopefully it is. It is. It's very applicable. I recommend your book all the time um, to colleagues, to uh, people that are navigating through these years, and even to people that are my age that uh, that say, man, that was really hard, and I don't want my children to have to face that. And I'm, I say, there are, there's a great conversation that you need to have. Here's how to have it, and these are the things you need to discuss. So, Star, thank you so You're much welcome. for coming what on. Um, successfully Navigating Your Parents' Senior Years is a great book. I highly recommend it. I will leave a link for you to um, quickly and easily find it. It's not only on Amazon or any other platforms that you might normally purchase mm-hmm. books from, but it's also Audible now. Right? Yes, so it's you Audible. Can listen to it in your car. It's Audible. How great is that? No excuses. No excuses for any of my listeners. Do I have time to say one more thing? One more thing. Okay. I just wanted to let people know that if for some reason they want to buy five copies or ten or whatever – That on my website, Mm -hmm. there is a link for a multiple book discount, and it's pretty sizable. And I've had elder law attorneys buy them and give them to their clients and uh, uh, aging life care managers. And and moms say, I've got five kids. I'm buying a copy for each of them. And I say, great, but then let's plan the conversation with all of them together. Uh, and so um, I just wanted to let people awesome. know. Awesome. And if you're following my channel, we may have an opportunity to uh, give away one of Starbucks, Star's Yay. books soon. So, And I might even be able to get the author to sign them. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'll donate the book. <laughs> oh, thank you. I so will be happy to. So we're definitely going to have a giveaway signed by the author. So stay tuned. Keep watching. Uh, one of the ways that you are going to know that is coming out is if you have subscribed. So if you huh. haven't subscribed yet, now is your chance. If you would like, subscribe, and please make sure to share this tool so others can find it. You're Thank doing you so great much. work, Julie. Thank you so Great much. work. Thank you.